hi everyone. Um, welcome to this Carcanet book launch. Welcome back. We um, had like a month off this summer, so um, I'm really pleased to see you here, logging in now um, and joining us again. We're of course here to launch Fred Dagar's new collection for the unnamed. So thank you for being here with us. Um, my name's Jasmine. I'm just going to run over some housekeeping before we get going uh, properly. So firstly, thank you for paying to be here. We appreciate that very much. Um, I'm putting the link and the discount code in the chat for you. Um, and we can go over that again later on. So what's going to happen this evening is we're going to be together for about one hour. Um, I can see that some of you have found the chat box. Um, when you're using the chat, please make sure that you change the option to everyone so we can all see each other's messages. Uh, but let us know where you're watching from and what you think of the reading. Um, just say hi to us down there. That's really nice. Um, as usual, I'm going to show the text during Fred's reading. Um, that's just so you can read along, but you are in control of the screen. So um, you should be able to change it to suit any needs that you've got. Um, so have a fiddle with that if you need to. And if you've got any questions about the tech, put them in the chat and I'll see if I can do my best to help you while we go through the evening. Um, Later on in the evening, there will be um, a chance for you to ask your own questions to Fred. So um, there is the chat box, but there's also a di different button uh, which says Q&A on it. So if you find the Q&A box, then you can get your questions for Fred lined up in there um, so that he can answer them later on in the event. So I think that's all of that stuff out of the way. Um, we are also uh, joined by Andre Nafis Sahili, which I'm really pleased about. Um, and he's going to be talking to Fred later on in the event after um, Fred has read some of the poems to us. Um, but first, I will introduce him. Um, so we'll begin. Um, Andre is the current editor of Poetry London. He's also the author of two collections of poetry, most recently High Desert, which came out from Blood Axe Books in 2022. Um, he's also translated over 20 different titles, uh, including one of our own Karkana editions called Beyond the Barbed Wire, um, which is selected poems by Abdelati Labi. Um, and you can see that on our website. So I'm just putting that in the chat for you there as well. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, I'll invite Andre to join me on screen. Thank you. We'll begin. Thank you so much, Jasmine. I really appreciate that. And um, thanks to everyone else at Carcanet too for allowing me this pleasure and privilege um, to um, help host tonight's um, launch of For the Unnamed. Um, I've, I've written out a little um, introduction for the book just to get us into the swing of things. Um, but first I thought I'd mention um, what, yeah, what exactly what a pleasure and privilege it is to be doing an event with Fred. Um, He's actually someone, and I've never really had much of a chance to say this in public, but he's someone whose work, or at least the awareness, my awareness of his work has been contemporaneous to my understanding of poetry full stop in the sense that partly as a result of the accident of, um, of biography um, in the sense that when I was starting to read contemporary poetry seriously, he was part of a generation that was really leaving its mark at the time. But in a sense, I cannot think of poetry about thinking of Fred Daguiar, um, and alongside with some of um, his other co-evils, Michael Hoffman and Mark Ford being two great examples. And so he's someone whose work I feel that I could be reading the entirety of my adult life, really, especially my creative life, and someone who continues to be an inspiration. Um, Jasmine Candley earlier mentioned my last book, High Desert, and there's actually a poem uh, about a very strange train ride I, I took more than a decade ago in Russia, which I dedicated to Fred because I think not only was I in conversation with him about the subject of that story, but he's also someone who's left his mark stylistically and thematically on me. Um, but the first time I actually worked with him was when I invited him to submit to uh, to write an essay for uh, the Palm Beach Effect, the volume of reflections I did about the work of Michael Hoffman. Um, but I think one of the, the greatest privileges really about um, being engaged with Fred as a writer has been the challenge to really keep up with him. And I mean that both in an intellectual and geographical sense. I think his is one of the most truly cosmopolitan bodies of work in world poetry ever. And I don't think he's necessarily been given enough credit for it. I know, of course, many academic volumes and more has been written about his work, but just the broad range of it, you know, from the Guyana of Mama Dot and Airy Hall to the London of British Subjects, a fantastic collection, to the Virginia of The Longest Memory, his novel. And we now have, you know, today, I think, perhaps, I wonder what Fred will say about all this later. He'll have the chance to, to debate me or say, no, you're completely wrong. But I think what we have is the latest installment or perhaps the final installment, who knows if you'll write more about the subject, but 
the third volume is something that I've started thinking of essentially as a California trilogy. And so we have For the Unnamed concluding what began with Letters to America and then continued with Year of Plagues, um, two books that I hope we'll bring up later in the conversation too. But these are three books that I feel like really sit naturally alongside one another. But obviously tonight we're here to read here um, poems for the unnamed, and I want to try and get us to the poems as quickly as possible. But um, I thought I'd just set up the reading in the sense that the plot of For the Unnamed, such as it is, is deceptively simple in a way that many of Fred's subjects can be, whether he's writing a poem or a novel or a piece of prose. We have two horses, obviously, pitted against one another. Only one victor can come out. So far, nothing unusual. But this was the Black Swan versus Sarko race, California's most famous ever horse race, which occurred in 1852 when Black Swan, which is a horse owned by Jose Supolveda, a new governor of California, beat Sarko, owned by a former governor of California, Pio Pico, in a race. And it, the distance that they raged was only 75 yards. Keeping in mind that California, geographically, such an extent, is such a huge entity, um, at the time, um, given that the network of roads wasn't exactly that wonderful either, you had families coming to Los Angeles from as far away as San Francisco and San Diego. So we're talking hundreds of miles just to see this race. I found an old newspaper report that described the scene. And I wanted to read a very short excerpt for you just to give you an idea of what must have intrigued Fred to write this book long sequence of poems, this book long poem. And I quote here, the quote begins, Caramba, a black jockey and a black horse, someone cried in Spanish. Indeed, it was a scene the spectators had never witnessed before. The jockey's name is lost to history, end quote. And that's all we hear about this unnamed black jockey. So here we have a situation where owners, horses, spectators, passersby all leave their mark, all have their names mentioned in various accounts, but we do not know the name of the black man who actually won the race. And we likely never will, or at least in cases like this, we never will. Um, the book, I have to say, I struggled, and I think this is true for so many truly original books. I struggled to find a parallel in explicitly another collection of poems. And I think that the parallel that I found most comfortable was um, Leonardo da Vinci's painting, The Battle of Anghiari, which he never really finished. And part of the reason I say that is because in this, in this painting, da Vinci tries to put together, really show what medieval hand-to-hand -hand melee was like. So put the horse rider and the horse and all the weapons and turn it into a mass where you could see the distinct elements still appear, but they were also fused into this inexplicable violent mass. And I feel like that's exactly what Fred does with this book long poem, where you have the, um, for the unnamed, the black jockey, dancing salt water, the horse trainer, black swan, the horse, and then the owner, Sepulveda, there's a cast of characters, both major and minor, but they're all intertwined, like in Da Vinci's painting. They're all trying to have their own say and also conversing with the author back and forth, but at the same time, also becoming something distinct of its own, all these elements leading into one new whole. And I think part of that is because of the specific moment that it's uh, 1852, you have this brutal transition where there is a sense of almost poetic justice in some sense, because the, um, the owners of the horses here, so Jose Sepulveda on one hand, Pio Pico on the other, any of you in the audience who've been to Los Angeles or even other parts of California will know those names because these were the, the scions of the great California families. But what they were, in essence, um, although I think there's been a lot of debate about it recently, but what they were, were Spanish colonists. And so you had this, in 1852, you had this supplanting of one colonial class, the old Spanish guard, by the new colonial class, the Anglo-American settlers, you know, both responsible for a slew of crimes, all of them uh, also against indigenous and black people. But you have this um, new era that California is entering. And one of the things I found really fascinating about it is that this horse race was also one of the last examples of the success that, that has always characterized California in colonial times. Um, because apparently people bet so much money on this horse race that the losing side essentially had their fortunes entirely depleted. And it, it was one of the contributing factors to this downfall of this land owning Spanish colonial class, right? So in this mass, again, of these, these horses and their owners and these named and unnamed historical characters, you also have Fred telling us 
his vision of the early story of what we now call California. Um, so as I said earlier, as Jazz underscored, Fred will read some poems and then we'll come back and have a conversation. Then at the end, I'll take some questions um, from all of you via the chat box. But um, without further ado from me, you've heard too much from me as it is, um, please give a warm welcome to Fred Dagar. And uh, yeah, Fred, we'd love to hear some poems. Hello. <clears throat> hi, hi, hi. Thank you, Andre. Historically wise as you are, I wouldn't dare contradict anything that you said. And I'm actually grateful for your insights, partly because the, the reader always knows more than the writer. And the poem, of course, is wisest of all. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, Alison Brackenberry is there. It's great. Rachel Haddis, Liz Lafoy. Peter Roscoe, some great people. So I'm so glad that you've found the time and everybody else. So thank you for, for tuning in. Um, Andre, you've set the poems up so beautifully that I, I almost don't want to read. <laughs> Go buy the book. Um, but actually, I, I, the sound of my voice is, is, is important because I, I had to try and find my way <clears throat> around the subject of a historical event because I, I've always been interested um, in how the past informs the present and nicely shapes the future, and how it helps me to make sense of, of um, my locations and my echoing, as it were, to try and find my way. So this, this event and these poems are, are an attempt at understanding a really complicated present that I'm in. It's also weird because I'm, <clears throat> I, I, I'm in a present which I thought would not come back. I honestly felt that we'd solved so many problems in this, I guess, when I, in my adolescence in the 70s and then in the 80s in, in London, in England, the UK, and so on, that those problems were solved and dusted. And to see everything come back with a, and doubling down on some things that I thought had been worked out has made the historical move in books and thinking even more important because um, it's never over, as they say. So uh, without further ado, I will now go to the poems. Uh, Paul. We gather for him. Hundred strong choir, cathedral bell tongues, dance troupe at traffic lights break out on red in the middle of the road. Stadium where beats rock young, middle, old. Bring him back from dead too long, raise him. Claim him from some unknown grave that kept him lost in history, stranded outside time, banned from his name. Calling. Come back now for us who need you more than you should know or care. You seem big to us, time chained to your skin, stretched by our summons, fused to your good name. You cannot be us, your cord blood for ours, if we find your name buried in your time. If you answer us from your bed of skin made by history for us to sleep in, that keeps us awake. BJ looks back. BJ is black jockey. Um, in my game, if I glance round, it's to catch how much more dust I need raised to blind the field trailing in my wake. I may have been beside a river in a charitable little tent when I fell out my mother, grabbed my first hungry breath. I dreamed of a place on a hill overlooking the sea Full ships docking riches, jumping fish, handed me spoon-fed 
gold platter. Or a farm, deep in country, fenced by forest, stream, mountain, no barbed wire or weapons, wheat, grain, sky heavy with fruit. Blues so sweet, sad that deep, cut I welcomed, neck bared for warm blade of that flood swept me up, off. Oh. I'm told I looked small for my age, quick, strong. Show me anything once, I would show it back at twice the speed. I moved all the time, walked fast with a bounce, nicknamed Hurry Up Man. What I know from that time, confined to skull, kicked by a horse I whipped on a ride in a bad mood. That horse waited for me to pass behind it, and bang, me out cold for two days. I walk without my name or my pass. I learned from what they told me about our plantation and cabin that someone owned me. I swore to buy myself for my sanity. Took horse, kick, a sense, knocked into me to take notice of my escape ticket. I prayed for speed. Horse brought power. I asked for strength. Horse snorted, pawed, nodded shook. Horse, let me stand in stirrups as I held on for my life until we crossed line after finish line first. Dancing salt water. I totally invented this trainer as a Native American who lived, belonged to the Tonga tribe, a local tribe in this area, LA Basin. More of the life of a man on the run, less of his sins from his time with a gun. If you know better than you, be the one to judge if what I did, you would have done. Don't say one word, just think it through. What in this time is a person to do, surrounded by folk who buy up and outsell humans as stock, seen as two thirds people, land, that whites cleared with cannon and rifle by picking off tribes while waving a Bible. God's chosen an earth to spread civilization among ungrateful primitive First Nations. All of my words channel through me. None of what I say, sorry for history. I live as I must if I want to survive. It's easy to say different when not in my shoe. I side with the winners against my own tribe. I act my part to train what they find wild. Joyce is Dancing Saltwater's partner. And she replies to him after he says something. Need I remind you, DSW, who showed their most private parts, kicked by a horse, you cross the wrong way. For me to rub aloe vera and you to groan at first that turned to moans. Didn't I stitch you moccasins that drew compliments every time you stepped out in them on account of your initials in bold red on leather dyed black colors of our tribe? Was I the one who said there could be none other walking this earth like me? BJ the black jockey. And now I have BJ in conversation with his partner. So there are these couples brought into the drama of, 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 the, of the story. BJ, this stream makes my skin feel new, turns your brown lips two shades bluer. I feel weightless in it, as if our love lifts our history off my back and us off our feet so that we float in a stream outside our time. If I can trust our love as the thing that makes the stream pull, push, and sing. Do not let go of my hand. Everything that I know lasts as long as you keep my grip in this stream that we bathe each other in. Ethel is his partner. Not the light of the moon, 
but the moon by whose light we count our luck in stars. Not the call of the caribou, but the caribou in each of us that calls for the other. Not the burn of midnight oil, but midnight's oil on our skin burned as we clashed in bed. We cast long shadows around our walk and hands held talk. Shadows that melt under us if time reads as our shadows it passeth not for our love. Once, sorry, thank you. Once or twice in life, love strikes your spine, straightens curves at top and tail into lightning rod, her fingertips, tongue, touch by one or two, though never both at the same time for this love, not just sex, it's what flesh thirsts for more than breath, even more than death equals free. Ethel and BJ, they have a child, I imagine. Does my belly show? Your belly shows. Am I getting fat? You've gained the necessary weight. You still love me. I love you twice as much for what you carry for both of us. But do you still want me? You have to ask. Look at us. Make it every chance we get. What if you fall for another? I would be out of my mind. Have a doctor check my head and heart. You have an answer for everything I say. Don't you? Don't pretend that you don't. BJ and Ethel, come here. What, here? Yes, here. Now? Yes, now. Unless you think it's a bad, I want you. I can't get enough of you. One day you'll regret that you said that. Let's not waste valuable time waiting for that day. Paul calling called. This is where you get your full name, match your race, fame, make history, years. No fanfare of drums, procession of dancers, released white doves or shaman canticle, just weeds of words gathered by hook, dipped into a sea, folded like a book, with you lost there until we fish you out for a second look at what history took for too long gone. And so as good as dead with nothing left and nothing said. BJ. In my dreams, I fly across a deep blue on the back of a horse with wings for hoofs, and all I have to do is hold on for dear life, breathe at the speed. We leave sparks in our wake seen as shooting stars. We rest. As moon is to earth, as fish is to sea, so horse is to me. I ride for a life horse makes worthwhile. Moon one. Well, if they can all talk, the moon can talk too. And if, if you're a playwright, of course, or a novelist, you know about this third person and omniscient that I was trying for here. Count yourselves Armed, I cover ground you walk. I bathe your skin, silver glaze your eyes, liquid light my way behind your eyelids, under your tongues, nails between blinks, so that what I do stands for what you think. By you, I mean all things, bipeds, quadrupeds, hills, valleys, towns, city, lake, rivers, even the wide mouth sea. Here we pause for some talk. Thank you so much, Fred. It's um, wonderful to hear the the poems um, out loud for the first time for me. So this is this is very exciting. But um, I wanted to jump in straight into the to the California nature of the books. You know, I think without you know, because I I won't. I've just realized that I, I'm not going to hold to the trilogy aspect of the California books because I don't 
want this to be the third and last. And I hope that there'll be more volumes about California. But I'm curious, um, was, uh, did you always know that you would write about California, especially in such a level of detail, right? Because when we talk about Year of Plagues, um, which was a, a book you wrote under the shadow of death, right? You're writing about living with cancer in the pandemic. You've got Letters to America and then Four and the Unnamed, all essentially very close together and back to back. And they are in dialogue with one another, certainly. I think that you probably had less of an objection with. But did you always know that California would speak to you in such a way? And I also wonder, um, did you feel that um, history was also, um, that writing this book essentially would also be something that you could sink your teeth into creatively about after writing a, bo a book that was so deeply set in the present, the way Year of Plagues was, the way Letters to America was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you um, for that, Andre. Well, as you know, from, from your high desert and with history as, an, as, your, as your grounding, um, it's usually important to, to take the ideas that you have and plant them in the landscape. Otherwise they seem to fly around and lose their grip and become ethereal. Not that, nothing wrong with the ethereal, but then the reader can't quite get hold of them. So the slippery nature of ideas anyway, it's usually great to try and ground them. So for me, whenever I've arrived in a place, I try to write my way into the landscape as an act of reading and of leave it, living and breathing. And so for, it made sense with California, quite a big long state, hard to drive up and down it, it takes a, forever. Um, uh, it, it, it was important for me to, to say, oh, here I am now, having been in the East Coast for a while, was in the, in the South for a while, left London, left Guyana. I find that the books have all been following that trajectory and also trying to keep, keep a sense of this idea of a splintered self, a sense of self, never unitary, always a sense of not a single voice, not even schizophrenic, but plural and multiple. And to try and get all those noises in my head and heart, spinal column, to, to kind of belong in the soil as you would as a gardener when you plant several plants and you've got to clip back those roses and keep them neat. I do a little bit of gardening, but not enough to, to boast about. I have no nails to show for it, but I do enjoy gardening. I do enjoy looking at how plants behave, how nature behaves and the clues for us as people in how to belong in a way. So yeah, I, I think um, that the California interview by the landscape that's going on with me is ongoing. Um, every book I write feels like my last book, 40 Unnamed feels like, you know, okay, <laughs> I'll be lucky if I get another book, but who knows? And it's not true. It is just my contract with the muse. I always said to the muse, give me your last ounce. And then I get to everything I can and say, okay, see you again, never. Yes, next time, because you fool yourself into a completion because you want everything to go into that project. And so I do tend to go back to a, a site of no return to find something else that is elsewhere and then come across something else. And I'm surprised by reading and living and what people say and by history, continually surpri surprised by landscape. I am in grief, I must say, about the, the last, this century, I know there's a lot to look to and, you know, chatbot and what have you, AI. But for me, seeing the way in which the landscape has been abused, it's been an incredible elegy looking around. I know it's going to last for a long time, but this idea that we would continue forward at full speed, extracting, destroying, renewing, has made me even more than a socialist than I actually want to be in that I'm into so, you know, social living, as it were, and, and being active in the community. But I've seen profiteering and capital misbehave in the landscape without stopping, with impunity. And I think that there's a little bit of shock in the book as well, that I had to go back in time to speak to that present um, and to try and understand it too. So, so the landscape is instructive. As, and as you say, California is a, a country in its own right the size of the landscape and its sense of scale and then heading looking back to the east as well in the time zones um it, it, it demands a lot of you as a reader and writer 
Yeah, I can certainly see that. I mean, I think um, while it's it's probably too binary in thinking, it, it reminds me of that um, that thing that Christopher Isher would said about newcomers to California that you either go completely Hollywood and plastic, or you become this prophet railing against excesses and abuses. And I think you know it's it's I think it's probably the healthier of the two options um, doing this. Um, one of the the things that I was I was really curious to know about, obviously, you know, the the unnamed black historical figure is really a central part of your work, right? And it's it's one that transcends the, the genre, right? Whether it's poetry or novels, you know, you got Feeding the Ghosts, right? Um, where you've got this um, slaves who survived being thrown overboard, telling the story that they never actually got to tell in real history, right? And then one, as you know, one of my favorite poems of yours at the grave of the unknown African, right? Where you're talking about this 18th century servant and coming across uh, this marker in Bristol, right? And so in a sense, you know, coming, you know, seeing you write about the unnamed black jockey who won that race is, is certainly a natural progression. What I'm curious about more is also the polyphonic approach you've taken. Because I think one of the reasons you very kindly kind of um, asked me to do this as well is that the fact that we've both been listening to this specific moment, these specific projects, being interested in history as a polyphonic song or chant with various characters coming in, right? Whether real, imaginary, um, whether you're basing it a lot on records or where there's, you know, you're filling in more of the blank because there is no record, like with the jockey, right? But I was also really interested to hear about what it was like to write in the horse's voice, because I, I have to say, you know, um, the, those were poems that, it, it's, it's, an, it's interesting, actually. I, I used to love poems where essentially, you know, the writer would anthropomorphize um, a given animal and, and speak in their voices, and obviously some more successful than others. But I had that um, uh, that pleasure entirely killed in me for good and in good and bad ways. When um, I remember, I had this class with um, with Kathleen Jamie, where she tore apart this poem by Ted Hughes, where he's speaking in the voice of the salmon, right? And she said, I think quite rightly, you know, do we really think that a salmon would think and feel this way? Um, and I think one of the, the reasons, and then as a result of this class, I started looking at these kinds of poems a lot more critically. Um, but one of the things that I think makes it work, you're, when you write in Black Swan's voice specifically, because I think those are some of the most interesting um, poems in the book, um, is your ability that whenever you're resurrecting these these unknown personages from history, whether human or inhuman at this point, right? Um, you've got this knack of coming in and even saying it word for word in certain poems, hey, cut the crap, man. This is not what actually happened. Let me tell you, this is what really happened. And you introduce doubt at every juncture. And this is what I think keeps the poems fresh and honest, frankly, this, this constant interjection. So you're not just in having these characters in dialogue with themselves, you're also having them in dialogue with you and various parts of yourselves too, and others too. You're also looking at what the outside pers you know, perspective might be outside of you entirely as the author. Yeah. So yeah, I was wondering uh, what led you to this polyphonic route? You know, do you think that's the only way we can write genuinely about the past? I mean, I think there's a reason why you and I and others have written about the past in a polyphonic way, perhaps because it keeps things a little more ground, a little more honest. And then, yeah, specifically kind of as part of that, what was it like to write in the voice of uh, Black Swan? Yeah, no, thank you for, for saying that. And, and for, for mentioning that anthropomorphic um, impulse, which can be colonizing. It can be that you colonize a subject by laying a language on it that's your own, and it could be an ego trip. For me, it's the opposite. Um, We've actually seen stones and horses and inanimate and, and living na nature as quite passive. And we've come and we've dropped an interpretation on them. And I think what we now need is for more thinking on behalf of objects that we didn't credit with the biography. Because if we enliven them with the nervous system, we would be probably less inclined to abuse them to the extent that we do. If we didn't see them as lesser than, if we saw the conversation as, as the, on an equal plane. So my, my, my vibe is not to colonize because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a decolonizing subject. Look at me, very hard, colonize and recolonize. Um, I just can't, I'm, I'm congenitally against it. So for me, when I, when, I, when I throw my voice, it's in order to throw away a colonizing zeal and to embrace something new that I don't know. Quite often when I write, and this is to do with polyphony, I think. I'm not sure where I'm heading. I may have a sound or a tune or a phrase, and also an outrage. George Floyd is killed. You bet I'm mad. Well, I reach for my pen, but I, you don't see half of what I produce there. 
at some point I get to something that I think, oh yeah, I don't, I didn't know this, and I keep going with that. So polyphony approaches a subject like collage, but also from many points of view to try and get at something that's unknowable in a Beckett, Beckettian sense, you know, like Beckett's unknowable, but also something that can be found out by an act of bringing as many selves as possible to help me out. A unitary, a unitary self, a single eye, doesn't cut it for me because that's where the colonizing comes in. That's where the blinkers come in and you throw away complexity for a simple linearity. And that's a dangerous thing. It's very seductive. It's easy on the reader's ears and eyes and heart. But actually, the reality is much more complicated, potholed, many avenues and so forth. I write a complexity than the simplicity. And I've always gone for that. So if you, you know, you and when I was at college, we used to hold up, you know, what, what is simple and what is complex in that binary way that um, we did at university. And people would say, Faulkner, very complicated. Hemingway, very simple and light. What are you, Fred? And I always went towards Faulkner, not because there's anything wrong with a hanging Hemingway sentence, and it's, but I did feel a lot was lost. But that simplicity and that paved sense of clarity and so I'm suspicious of clarity, especially because in history, so much is missing and silenced by that. The voice of the domineering singular consciousness leaves out the losers, so-called losers. People who lost end up being the ones who actually saved our present by, the, by being vanquished, because if they hadn't, it would have been this one, you know, an eye for an eye. So I've actually looked back at the historical examples and I've begun to feel that the polyphony is out of an, a series of absences in need of articulation out of my nervous system, one. And two, I can find out something about the present that I didn't know over and above reading about it in a linear fashion and something about that feeling, emotional intelligence that people have talked about that I now understand. I also think with polyphony, finally, it's a long answer. You ask a question, you're going to get an answer. <laughs> Sorry, it's so long. But I, I, I wrote plays. Uh, I've written plays, you know, and once you have a stage and you have people talking and contradicting each other, well, you know, as, as I said, I contradict myself, so I contradict myself, you know, as I famously said way back. Um, <laughs> No, this is this is great. Thank you, Fred. Um, I wonder if we could um, hear some more poems. I think mean, this is a perfect segue into some uh, some other poems from the book, and then we'll we'll come back. And I've got another question for you, but I know there's there's a few waiting in the um, in the chat box too. So um, yeah, we'd love to hear some more poems, please. Yeah, they are mercifully short. <laughs> Here goes <clears throat> a few more short ones, just to give people a sense of the scope. So we had moon one, but actually, actually, that's not the quote. That's the whole thing. What you're going to hear is um, just the center, this bit here. First, he walked beside me. Next, he ran with me as much as he could keep up with his skinny legs and narrow chest. As I cantered, more sauntered along to allow for his pace. Then he sat on me in the stable and combed me busily as if he thought I might buck and send his meek frame flying into the rafters or worse, out the top of the roof for him to land flat in the yard. I sent him a message through my black skin to his. The message said, do not fear me, black man. I mean you no harm. We have a race to win and there's only one way to win it. At this point, I felt this quiz in his interest through his skin, him asking me how, in static, jumping from him to me. I said straight out what we must do to secure this victory of the century. Let's go to the next page. Here we go. And this is the black jockeys talking back to the horse or replying. If I become you and you become me, comma, you would know my life born into slavery. What a privilege for a horse. Welcome to days on the run from slave catchers, dreams to cross the Atlantic and reverse, untangle knots of tides, 
turn my life on this continent free among equals, break the chains of my people. I see my life as a horse. You as me and me as you, one being mixed from two. Aware of despair, we keep a smile, a touch of style. Crumbs, we eat the same corn, you prefer hay. I can't stomach that, though I chew bits of it to settle my stomach and clean my teeth. But I just confess that. You make me speak my mind like only Ethel can. Not even your trainer, my longtime friend, dancing salt water, knows this about me. But my jockey ambition is second to none, Ethel and my race included. Black Swan, and you get to eat hay, walk on all fours and carry all and sundry on your back. Folks see you and want a taste or better feel of your power between their legs. If I may phrase it the way people declare when they sit on my back and I gallop for them and my pace travels up my legs and spreads through my body and they feel this charge of my muscles like no feeling they've known bigger than the best of their lives, big as anything asleep. They dismount, giddy, knock-kneed, brimful, as they take a part of me with them under their skin, in their muscle, It travels to their hearts and minds and instructs them, I believe, about horses joined to humans, one inseparable from the other, bonded by a current that keeps our lives afloat until they bet on a horse and switch to seeing us as easy money, ditching wisdom about us and them. If my hide, hoofs, mane, trust me to win this game. Moon two. I say I when I mean we. I speak for the sun who lost their tongue or deigns to speak when this human run a time and earth is done, which should not be long, as the crow flies, as the earth turns in its star urn. A Mediterranean morning lands in LA. Light strokes from the sun, sowed by breeze off the Pacific that mops the dew off blades of grass the milk moustache of a calf. Wood shutters swing open fast and on time, and for those who partied through the night, today starts with a deliberate drag of its feet, with wads of time to spend and an audience. Folk put down poles and buckets to mark their spot as they grab a bite or a bathroom break, as they tip a lad to hold their spot by the road, as they top up their bets. The air among people carries this current, so that everyone is giddy and impatient at once and want this race to be over already so they can party with their win. It's the kind of ready that does not need a starter's gun, the start of something on the way before it properly begins, the way history feels as it's being made. Thank you. Thank you for that. that was fantastic. And thank you also for, for um, um, reading from the Black Swan passages. Like I said, they're, they're really some of my um, the favorites in the book. Um, and, you know, for the next question, I actually wanted to fold in straight away to um, some of the questions we've um, had sent to us, because one of them folds really neatly into the, the one that I wanted to ask right now as well. So uh, this is from Nancy Ann Miller. Um, who asks, uh, and I quote, did you decide to use the voice of his loving partner to make us have a more intimate knowledge of the unnamed jockey, to make his presence more felt, end quote. So that's Nancy Ann Miller's question. And I think it folds into mine in the sense that my question really would be, since we, you know, to segue from the conversation about the polyphonic nature of the work, you know, which of the voices came more naturally to you and which didn't? I think we're um, all curious to hear that. But yeah, over to you. Yeah, no, thank you for, for that question, Nancy. Um, it's interesting with biographies that are imaginary because they're absent. If you're going to make them up, you better make it good. <laughs> Otherwise, don't bother. 
And for, and for me, if someone is unnamed, it's such an insult, it's such a neglect, it's such an erasure that you want to fill that life with a biography, with desire in particular. Um, and with location too, um, I felt a lot of his dialogue with her would help with his sense of w what he's about to do. And also give him a private life that he wrote, he rides a horse, but he's also alive in a landscape and fi trying to find his way. So I don't, she's not used in a sense to, to make him better. I think she extends who he is and she pre she becomes present and, and responsible for telling some of his and their story. It's part of the polyphony and part of the idea of it as a drama with several voices chipping in in a collage effect to help with the story. So it makes it sensuous. It makes it living. It gives it a kind of violent, a nervous system, blood, something felt. And then all the ideas that I have, of course, with, with big ideas, you know, and I read a lot of theory, I teach. You've got to always take theory and stick its head into story. Because if theory rears its head without being controlled, you're in trouble as a poet. Um, so you always find finding ways to help theory to, to both be in the poem, but also for the poem to show as if it has light and weightless without it. So my, 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 my trick was to disguise a lot of the things I was thinking about history and location and absence and pain and despair with some lightness, some humor, something memorable, some kind of rhythm as a way of making sense. I hope that makes sense. No, I think it makes perfect sense, actually. And um, I, and I think actually this, you know, to, to progress from that directly onto the form, really, because um, again, this is um, a question where it touches on something that I wanted to um, to hear you uh, talk a little bit. But we've got uh, the next question from, from Michael Schmidt, um, who wonders if you could comment on the suppression of the article, especially the, the, the definite article. Um, what are you up to? He wants to know right now. <laughs> I am an oppressor in turn. Uh, thank you for asking about it, Michael. As you can see with, with, the, with the hoofs idea too, there is this fight in language. H-O-O-V-E-S becomes H-O-O-F-S because people have used that plural noun and it's changed stylistically, but I wanted to go back and I, I, I love H-O-O-F-S. With the suppression of definite article, I don't like, I'd use it, but if something is the thing, it immediately says to me, oh yeah, I'm, I'm also this. There's always a slippery nature of pinning it down. And definite articles are useful, but in poetry, they, unless you really want to pin something down for a particular view to help the reader to trampoline into something else, um, suppress it. And then, in, and then in the Caribbean, what I've also tried to get back to is a, a, some sense of a Caribbean rhythm in an English standard setting. And there is that, and one of the things in in Caribbean English is um, is a suppression of that uh, suppression of the, of the definite article, a preference for nouns and verbs. You know, moving forward with thought, and then I think you help the reader to supply what's missing as an active, an active active reading. So reading is not a passive thing. So I, if you erase some of the things that should be in a sentence, the readers will supply them for their own sense. So you don't have to do everything as a poet. You don't have to write everything, for goodness sake. The reader is not, you know, the reader is actively there. Let them lean into the text, invite them in with some absences and so on. So I do, there is a non naughty part to my composition, if I may say, in that people will say, this is not correct. And I say, good, you're reading. Had I made it correct, it'd be just relaxed. I don't want them relaxed. I want them to be tense. I want them to think what? And do a double take, just as I had to double take and be hurt by the event that I got provoked into. So, and also the reader, as it's said by the novelist um, from the eighties, he said that the reader is always right. You know, I, I could acknowledge that I need the reader. I need that relationship as an active thing with agency as the text is made by the reader, which I have to surrender as a book. And, you know, thank God, I mean, I hope for readers. And if you also hope for readers who are actively reading um, and, so yeah, I, I wonder if this was uh, a conscious part of the, uh, and I'll make this very very quick because um, I, I want to get back to um, to just hearing some poems from you really. But um, I wondered one of the uh, 
the the most pleasant things I've heard and sort of described about books that really delve deeply with history. Um, and it's been something that's cropped up with various books, but the sentiment seems to gyrate around this specific core, which is that um, the reader, sort of the abstract reader, is drawn to it because you can more easily form an emotional connection when you're dealing with a historical poem rather than, say, um, a history book, right, where you've got a proper work of history history where there's there's actual scientific analysis going on and and everything's being properly bibliographed right so um did, did you feel that that was something that you wanted to do or is that you think just a happy byproduct of the experience in the sense I, of, is this something that you really wanted to um emotionally engage with that to to see history that way because obviously you know your entire work's really being i mean a lot of the work's being personal experience right particularly the earlier books but essentially you've just been um also a great historian via your novels your poems is that part of the mission for you i'm, I'm basically trying to get a sense yeah. of fred's mission as the historian in his literary work yes Absolutely. No, no, no. Absolutely. 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 Yes, 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 yes. When I was um, way back in my teens, Kamal Brathwaite wrote The Arrival, the trilogy. He was trained in history at Cambridge, from, came from Barbados, did his PhD in history, and is a poet. And his work, if you look so full of music and Caribbean rhythms and ideas about place and people, so yeah, I, I was very attentive to 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 the understanding that if you're historically aware with your poetics, you're engaged with the politics of your time, which for me is crucial because if I'm hurt by my present and so much happens that's hurtful and that um, angers me actually uh, and provokes me, that I better have a response, a poetics to help me respond, otherwise I'll be flabber, flabber, flabbergasted, speechless, immobile, catatonic. And the last thing you want to be in history is catatonic with your present. You've got to fight back, push back, lean back. And poetry um, with that historical awareness has been the thing for me that's enshrined the poetics. It's an aesthetics too that isn't um, described in a room free of history. It's seen as located in history. So I am still into pop songs. I'm still into, you know, a good opera. I'm not telling you which opera, because you'll all go, go want to go see it. If Fred likes opera, what? But I do. Don't tell anyone I said this, but I do. I like classical music. I listen to rap. I listen to folk music. So I know that I, I am into rhythm big time as a way of, a method of discovery and as an aesthetic for the line and for the balance of the phrase and its memorability, all the, the mnemonics to do with history, writing as an art form, as an oral form. So um, yeah, I would never fight or deny history. I always like, yeah. I love that, neither fight nor deny history. I mean, that's um, a perfect point to hear some more poems, I think. Uh, would you oblige us? I think I, yeah, I may have, I think I, I'm closing with one, right? I, is that right? In my scroll, I I picked um, yeah the title poem for the unnamed. This is a title poem, and it's in the but you see the book. It says page one eleven. Don't be scared by that. It's <laughs> there's lots of white space around the poems for the unnamed. Come to us showing bare palms scored with lifelines, lived on behalf of the drowned. Speak to us through sealed lips, stitched by needles wielded from their time to our standard. We hear groans, screams, pleas. See veins stand on foreheads, necks, temples, threaded in eyes. Understand that for us to move, we must tread on their bodies, three deep in places, yielding. Accept that we breathe for them, air taken from them, speak as them with our unsealed mouths. If this chant counts for anything, our slogans, our fists strike air, our feet stamp songs.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Alison. Thank you so much, Fred. That was brilliant. Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. That's that. Thank you. Thanks, Carcanet, Jazz, for handling things. Thank you Hi, so much. Um, yeah, it was really wonderful to hear you talking about the book. Um, and thank you guys for all being here. Your messages were great. They're still coming. Um, and thanks for your questions. Um, yeah, we really, really appreciate it. Let me give you guys the link again. Um, please do use your discount code um, and buy a copy of the book. Buy one for your friends as well. Um, <laughs> it'll come as an email tomorrow. So um, uh, you don't need to do that right now. And if you have any problems, obviously, as ever, trying to get hold of the book, just get in touch with us and we'll do what we can to help you. Um, so, yeah, massive congratulations, Fred. Um, and thank you again. And you guys should also know that Fred is coming to the UK this autumn. Um, there are some readings lined up. Um, one of them is in Manchester. One of them is in London. So um, go to our website, please, and sign up for our newsletter so you won't miss seeing him in person. Um, we also have another online launch this time next week. We're going to be launching Isabel Williams' um, complete Catullus translations, which is super exciting. Um, Catullus is in bondage. Please join us. They're like crazy translations. It's going to be real fun. Um, so I think that's everything. Um, yeah. Thank you guys very, very much. Um, and congratulations again. And hopefully we'll see you all again. <laughs>